Chapter Four of Book Three of Les Misérables, Volume Two, by Victor Hugo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. Les Misérables, Volume Two, by Victor Hugo. Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. Book Third. Accomplishment of the Promise Made to the Dead Woman. Chapter Four. Entrance on the Scene of a Doll. The line of open air booths, starting at the church, extended, as the reader will remember, as far as the hostelry of the Thenardier. These booths were all illuminated, because the citizens would soon pass on their way to the midnight mass, with candles burning in paper funnels, which, as the schoolmaster, then seated at the table at the Thenardiers, observed, produced a magical effect. In compensation, not a star was visible in the sky. The last of these stalls, established precisely opposite the Thenardiers' door, was a toy-shop, all glittering with tinsel, glass, and magnificent objects of tin. In the first row, and far forwards, the merchant had placed on a background of white napkins an immense doll, nearly two feet high, who was dressed in a robe of pink crepe, with gold wheat ears on her head, which had real hair and enamel eyes. All that day this marvel had been displayed to the wonderment of all passers-by under ten years of age without a mother being found in Montfermeil sufficiently rich or sufficiently extravagant to give it to her child. Eponine and Azelma had passed hours in contemplating it, and Cosette herself had ventured to cast a glance at it on the sly, it is true. At the moment when Cosette emerged, bucket in hand, melancholy and overcome as she was, she could not refrain from lifting her eyes to that wonderful doll, towards the lady, as she called it. The poor child paused in amazement. She had not yet beheld that doll close to. The whole shop seemed a palace to her. The doll was not a doll. It was a vision. It was joy, splendour, riches, happiness which appeared in a sort of chimerical halo to that unhappy little being, so profoundly engulfed in gloomy and chilly misery. With the sad and innocent sagacity of childhood, Cosette measured the abyss which separated her from that doll. She said to herself that one must be a queen, or at least a princess, to have a thing like that. She gazed at that beautiful pink dress, that beautiful smooth hair, and she thought, how happy that doll must be. She could not take her eyes from that fantastic stall. The more she looked, the more dazzled she grew. She thought she was gazing at paradise. There were other dolls behind the large one, which seemed to her to be fairies and genii. The merchant, who was pacing back and forth in front of his shop, produced on her somewhat the effect of being the eternal father. In this adoration she forgot everything, even the errand with which she was charged. All at once, the Thenardier's coarse voice recalled her to reality. "'What, you silly jade! You have not gone? Wait! I'll give it to you! I want to know what you are doing there! Get along, you little monster!' The Thenardier had cast a glance into the street, and had caught sight of Cosette in her ecstasy. Cosette fled, dragging her pail, and taking the longest strides of which she was capable. End of Book Third, Chapter Four. Recording by Ruth Golding.